Hello everyone. We are just now starting the second event of our Kaleidoscope online festival. My name is Jukka Savalan and I'm the director of the Design Museum here in Helsinki and I will be the host of this uh, discussion today. Um, this online festival is part of the Itala Kaleidoscope exhibition at the Design Museum in Helsinki and also it's also part of the Helsinki Design Week uh, 2021. And the Itala exhibition looks at the history of Itala over its 140 years and Itala's links to culture and society, how it has been kind of driving Finnish society forward and being part of the Finnish society. Um, the Kaleidoscope Festival on Creativity is created in collaboration between Itala and the Design Museum in Helsinki. And today we will broadcast from Itala's account, but the recording of the uh, this talk can be found from Design Museum's Instagram TV soon after um, this talk is over. Today's very special guest um, is Paula Antonelli. Um, she's the curator of uh, design and architecture at MoMA. She's also the director of research and design at MoMA as well. And usually she doesn't need an introduction because she's one of the most influential design curators in the world. And she is really an activist on design and the importance of design also, and really broadening our views and our minds about what design is today and how design can affect our lives. But uh, without any further ado, let's invite Paula to join the discussion and the live broadcast. Welcome, Paula. Let's see if we can get her online as well. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people watching the live feed already and we are waiting to get Paula's uh, invitation visible also here and get her to join the uh, broadcast. One moment. Hello, Paula. Can you hear from, can you hear us uh, here in Helsinki? How is New York this morning? One more moment and we will get Paula to join. See. Hello, Paula. Can you see us? Are you able to join the live feed? But while we are waiting for the technical issues to solve, uh, to be solved, and get Paula to join the the talk. Like I said before, Paula is really a spokesperson for design and the kind of enlarged uh, use of design and really bringing out the potential of design in today's world. How through design we can tackle also the bigger issues of our societies and how we can build a more sustainable future. And she has been really, really active also on the side of her job um, at MoMA um, and she has had this very influential uh, Instagram live series called uh, Design Emergency together with Liz Rostom. And once we get Paula to join this uh, as well, I'm sure we will get uh, some thoughts on her that as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Should be her. It's also curious about this. So spare with us for one more moment as we try to get Paula to join the feed. Let's see. Got to Hello. send her a message. Mm-hmm. 
don't yet see hers. Oh, she cannot join. Let's see. Mm, try a different one. One more moment as we are trying to get Paula to join. There has been some difficulties in her joining, I think, but uh, we will try to get it solved as soon as possible. With like these kind of live feeds, it can happen sometimes. And I trust you guys to, don't tell anybody. This, this is actually my first ever live Instagram uh, feed. So um, ah, all right, there was a miscommunication about the time. But Paula will join in a second. Mm -hmm. I see that there's a lot of people from this one from Venezuela, from Japan, from Germany, so from all over the world. That's really good. That's really, really nice. And uh, Paula will join in, in a second, like said. Mm -hmm. I'm from Switzerland as well. Today is actually a very somber day as well, because today marks the uh, 20th anniversary or of the uh, 9-11 attacks in New York. And uh, of course it's a day that really touched a lot of people, touched myself as well, because I have lost part of my heart to New York. I lived and worked there in, the, in 2000 to 2002 as well. And uh, it's something that really shaped, shaped our world. But uh, one second, as we hope that Bala will be join, able to join in soon. But um, like I said earlier, this is also part of the Helsinki Design Week um, festival. And most of the festival or part of the festival is online because of the COVID-19 restrictions uh, still in uh, operation in Finland and in Helsinki. And um, there are some live events, but we at the Design Museum, we decided to hold our events uh, as online events. And that's why we organized this um, Kaleidoscope Creative Festival together with Ittala. And really, uh, now we have Bala. Yes. Hello. Hello, Paula. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I thought it was in one hour. Of course, there's always some issue with timing, you know. So I'm here. And I'm sorry I'm if I glad. made you all wait. And I have the worst lighting in the world because I was not ready with my like influencer lighting for you. But hey, we're, here we are. Good to see you here all. Here we are. Hello. Here we are. <laughs> Just before you joined, um, I told everybody that this is my ever, first ever Insta Live. So I oh. answered everybody to keep that a secret. So of course, you know, things go <laughs> sideways. Like oh, you're, doing, yes. you're doing great. I'm the one that's screwed up so far. So no, yeah, no we'll worries, do no it. Worries. Like I, I will try to expose my face to light every now and then <laughs> so. you look beautiful as always thank you thank um, you Yuka. so do you i hope you have had a good morning in new york and i was mentioning earlier it's uh, kind of a somber morning in new york i think and all over the world now with the 20th uh, kind of somber anniversary yes of attacks. it is somber and it is also another amazing new york morning first of all it's september in new york and just like 20 years ago it's a crystal clear gorgeous day and um and everybody you know people are so loving to each other that this morning i've just received messages from friends in new york just saying mm -hmm. thinking of you it's just like people are somber but also loving so yeah. it is um it is 
a really interesting morning. <laughs> so thank you. But we'll remember them all. Yes, mm -hmm. we will never forget the, get the attack and the, and the aftermath. But, um, but uh, we are here today to talk about design and the kind of role of design in culture and society. But uh, before we go deeper into those kind of deeper questions, uh, we ask you to kind of pick up, uh, pick out uh, your favorite piece by Itala. Uh, so kind of yes. uh, break the ice, so to speak. Can yes. you tell what you chose? Yes, uh, I chose I know Alto's Tumblr. Yeah, please show the image. You have it. Oh, you have the real thing. You also found the real oh, yes. color. Yeah, yeah. God bless you. So I know Alto's gorgeous Tumblr is my favorite piece. Of course, you know, when you think of finished design, you think usually you think either wood or glass. And when you think of glass, you tend to think of Alvar. Instead, I wanted to pick I know Tumblr because it is really the emblem of the kind of uh, humble masterpiece. I like to call these kind of objects. They're objects that are at the same time perfect and sublime, but also for everyone. That's what I love about that Tumblr. And um, uh, at MoMA, several years ago, I, I did a show from the collection, and that Tumblr is in the collection, that was called Humble Masterpieces, that talked exactly about all these different um, objects that are part of the whole world that belong to everyone and that for that reason are even more valuable to humanity right so to me i know stumbler is my emblem of Finnish design that's a very good choice and i think that's thank you to all of the uh, kind of listeners and viewers right that we have also on this yeah. uh, mm -hmm. broadcast but before we go further i whoever have joined now um thank, welcome to this uh Eat the Lucky Ladies Gold Festival uh, event that we're holding. This is the second uh, online talk that we're holding now. And I'm Jukka Savalan, the director of the design review, and I'm interviewing Paula Antonelli, the senior creator of architecture and design at MoMA, and also the director of research and information at MoMA. And who's speaking to you from her closet because she did not realize <laughs> that it was already time. She thought it was a, an hour late. And so she just like scrambled together. <laughs> 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 but uh, you are really a true spokesperson and a real design activist. Um, apart from your job at MoMA, which is, of course, one of the most prestigious art institutions in the world, uh, you have really been for years and decades already been talking about the importance of design and the role of design in our societies, in our, in our culture. And now we that live in very strange times when our future view is being distorted or even kind of stolen from us by the huge issues that our societies are facing. You know, we're in the midst of environmental crisis, social sustainable issues, the shaking up of capital system, erosion of democracies. Um, you also, you started this uh, very influential series when the pandemic hit us and really stopped us and isolated us from each other uh, called Design Emergency. Can you tell a little bit about the, about the Design Emergency series that you're holding and the kind of founding, why you founded the series in the first place? Definitely. So it was, um, it was the beginning of the pandemic and of the lockdown here in New York City. And uh, um, my husband and I were just, you know, at home, uh, just looking at each other and thinking, oh my, what's, what's happening? And uh, one of the things that we were, we were doing is we were discovering all these different means of communication. And there was um, um, a hip hop artist, Pat Joe, that was having every night these Instagram lives with various people all over the world. And, um, and so we thought, you know, I thought, you know, I can do that also. So I called up my, my great friend, Alice Rostorn, who also happens to be possibly the uh, preeminent design critic in the world and told her, hey, Alice, how about we do something like that? Because what Alice and I always try to do is to prove to as wide an audience as possible that design is fundamental to the destinies of society, that it's a force <clears throat> for good that it can really help us um, just design a better future not only for human beings but for all species and for the whole planet so <clears throat> we decided to um, to start by interviewing the designers that had an important role in the pandemic at the beginning and we decided to call the feed design emergency uh, alice called uh, frith kerr a wonderful designer in london and frith whipped together a great image 
for us in like four days and we started. And the first interview was Michael Murphy from Mass Design Studio. Michael is a wonderful architect. He's based in Cambridge, but the office is also based in Rwanda. And they have an amazing track record uh, for health facilities, healthcare facilities of all kinds, and also for emergencies because they helped Rwanda and other countries in Africa during the Ebola crisis a few years ago. They also helped Haiti during the cholera pandemic a few years ago. So they have this track record. They know how to deal with emergencies. And so we interviewed Michael. Then we interviewed Alyssa Eckert, who is one of the two illustrators from the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta that designed the illustration of the coronavirus that we all know that came to define this pandemic. You know, the one, the, the, the land mine, uh, the, the deep water mine with the, um, with the red spikes. Then we interviewed um, a designer from New Zealand that had designed the campaign for awareness, Mark Dalton is his name, had designed the campaign for awareness of COVID in New Zealand, which we thought was the best and so on and so forth. So we started all these great interviews and uh, uh, and we progressed like that weekly. And then at some point, we started also thinking about the future after the pandemic. And we're continuing in that direction. Right now, we're taking a hiatus because we're writing the book that's going to come out in May of next year. But we'll keep going. And, you know, for those of you who are following us, it's design.emergency. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely worth following. So please do that. Thank you. Don't mm -hmm. do that already. And... Um, Listening and following the series, a uh, couple of the topics, kind of broader topics that really uh, resonated with me, with me was that uh, the one that you gave about hope. And can you elaborate a little bit about that, about design and hope, how you see that and what's the designer's role in that? Well, definitely it, it's important to think about it because, am I there? We had a little bit of, am I back? Yep, there's right. always, yeah, there's always a little bit. Don't worry. It's your first time. You know, there's always something. Don't worry. <laughs> and then we come back. Yeah, so <clears throat> whenever we talk about emergency, we talk about response, but we can also talk about prevention. We can also talk about um, reaction. We can also talk about the antidote to the kind of panic that can happen in the event of an emergency. So it's very important to talk about hope, too. And design can give a lot of hope. I mean, to those that say that anything can save the world, I'm always like skeptical, nothing by itself can save the world. It's always a team effort. It's always many disciplines coming together. But design really, because of the activism that it can provide, it also is a force that can give hope. So we've been talking about that because many of the innovations of the forced innovations that happened during the pandemic can last and can give us um, a sense of how we can progress in the future. You know, in the middle of the pandemic, there were events like uh, blue skies in Beijing or Delhi or in Los Angeles, right? Or there were, um, just the, a, a sense of much more closeness to families that were actually living together. Of course, there were many other tragic and negative effects, but maybe we can try and hold on to those good effects by means of design. You know, the reduction in emissions that happened when people worked from home, the um, heightened respect for so many professions that are normally not taken into consideration. They're, they're all good effects that we could try to hold on to. Definitely, definitely. And I, I like the point. And, you know, we have gone through wicked problems before as well and catastrophes in, in the world. And I think design is a very powerful tool to go, go through those and, and really see a positive future as well. But the other... No, no, don't worry. It's all good. Mm -hmm. Good. The other one that really resonated with me as well was um, not a counterpart to, to hope, but almost, and that was violence and about design and violence. And of course, you know, we are the hum humans. We are very good in designing weapons, for example, that are more destructive and more powerful and, and more wicked in a sense. And as Victor Papanek once said, uh, there are professions, more, professions that are more harmful than industrial design, but only very few of them. Um, 
what message did you want to highlight with design and violence? So design and violence is a project from a few years ago, and I'm glad you brought it up because I'm very proud of it. You can all find it online if you want. Um, you can you can search design and violence and MoMA and you'll find it. So what happened is that um, the 3D printed gun was released. I think it was, I can't remember if it was 2014 or 2015. Anyway, the, the news of the 3D printed gun really kind of shocked me because I did not expect something as benign as 3D printing, or at least I thought it was benign, and mm -hmm. something as benign as open source to uh, have as an outcome a lethal weapon that anybody could print at home and actually without any supervision. I was really stunned by it. And then I was stunned by my reaction. I thought how naive to think that design would not be also used for evil, just as it could be used for good. So I started putting together a list of objects that have an ambiguous relationship with violence. I found that Victor Papanek uh, quote that you just mentioned. And then I called upon my great colleague and friend, Jamer Hunt. You see, I always like to, to work with friends and people that are better than I am and many things. And we started making a proposal for an exhibition. We made a list of objects that have an ambiguous relationship with violence. And then we made the proposal to MoMA. And understandably, MoMA, which is an art museum, said no, because it would have been a really weird exhibition in an art museum. It was more for a social history museum or even a natural history museum. But Jamer and I decided to do it anyway because we, we thought it was really important. So we started a WordPress site and we started every week publishing different objects and asking um, and asking just people that had an expertise in that particular object to write a commentary. For instance, we had a child soldier, a, a former child soldier from Sierra Leone, who's now become a really well-known author, China Keitetsi, write about the, um, uh, the Kalashnikov, the AK-47 uh, gun. Or we talked about a wonderful poster that was published by, that was designed by a, a Dutch company, Visionaire for Amnesty International about female genital mutilation. And we had Angelique um, Kibijo, who's uh, from a wonderful uh, Ghanaian singer, that, an artist that actually wrote a piece about Benin, Benin, I'm sorry, she's Beninese, that wrote a beautiful piece because she's been an activist for a really long time about it. So it was just fabulous. And because it was online, we, call, we could also have comments and people actually did come online and, and write comments and it became a real conversation that was super valuable. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, That's MoMA at some point decided to have it on its own website and then even published a book. I'm, I'm so glad that they did. And mm -hmm. you mentioned MoMA there earlier as well. And, you know, of course, MoMA is one of the most influential art institutions in the world. And it's when we talk about design and architecture, I think it's been the most it's been in the forefront for a really long time and it is, is still and it goes back to Philip Johnson and the machine art exhibition in 34 I think and uh, really pushing the boundaries of how we see design and how we see the industrial arts so to speak and their relation to our lives and culture. How do you see the role of museums today especially when it comes to the bigger role of design and also pushing the boundaries of how we think and how we build our futures and also maybe museums as activists as well? Yeah, well, I, I know that you are also very familiar with this topic because you run a museum, but museums, museums role changes with the changing times and also with the context, right? I'm thinking, for instance, of the role of many museums and of artists in situations like military regimes, for instance, in Brazil, um, where Helio Itisica, uh, who was an artist at that time, was organizing these apparently... Um, apparently, how can I say, harmless events for the public on Sundays. And they were these kind of systemic subversion, subtle subversion examples of how you could just remind people of what life is about, what creativity is about, you know, just give them almost like a window in a possible future. So that was a very extreme example. But even now, you know, with the everything that's going on in the world, it's, I, mean, I don't even know where to start uh, listing the terrible things that are happening, but I can give you an example in the past. 
A few years ago, uh, Donald Trump, who was at that time president of the United States, as you know, um, just published this edict and banned travel from five or six Islamic countries. Um, and it was really outrageous because it was so single-handed and unjustified. And in the span of 24, 30 hours at MoMA, my colleagues, because they did it mostly, reinstalled a gallery in the museum exclusively with work from the collection from those five, five six countries, right? So immediately. What happens in that situation? It's not that people will go to the museum. People will, but it becomes immediately an act that is picked up by the press, by social media, that shows that art, which is the window into the future, stands with those who are oppressed. Then we, you know, I remember when the uh, Supreme Court here in the United States declared gay marriage constitutional and legal, we immediately, um, we immediately installed the rainbow flag, which is part of the collection. You know, these are just like some examples, but I know that many other museums all over the world are reacting to these terrible news that we get every day. Uh, personally, a few years ago, you said that in my title, I'm also director of R&D. That gets me to talk about these R&D salons that um, um, I launched in 2012, so it's a long time ago. They are called R&D because the goal is to prove that museums can be the R&D of society. So these salons tackle uh, subjects like death, like uh, um, protest. Uh, there was one about white males. Uh, there was one about hair. And then there's, there was one about angels. When we were in the middle of such a hard time, it was about angels because we all were dreaming of having angels, right? So uh, it really is to prove that museums can help people deal with life, with death, with aging, with everything. Even those are online, by the way. You can search for MoMA R and D and you'll find them. And uh, I, I'm very proud of them. And right now I'm working together with Helena Cleaver and I'm working on the next ones. One is about post-traumatic post stress disorder, PTSD. Mm -hmm. And another one is Renaissance or revolution because everybody's talking about Renaissance, but I don't see it coming. And Renaissance is not always so good because it usually implies an oligarchy of people that decide what's good and that fund what's good. So See, these are very political topics yeah. that um, are tackled in museums through art and through artists, not only on the walls, but also in conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm good. sure you are doing things too um, to respond uh, to everything that's going on. We're trying. We're trying our best. And I think uh, many institutions are. But I know you understand it's always not easy uh, from the institutional side, but it's very important to act as well and do and, and really show because museums and other institutions have very powerful voices and we need to use those voices. We are not neutral platforms, but we always have an agenda that we want to bring forward. And, and it's also important that we give room to other voices, not only our own voice, but maybe to people who don't have voices uh, or whose voices are not heard otherwise. And the examples you gave are, are very good in that as well, I think. But um, in addition to your kind of day work at, uh, at MoMA, you are a curator curating exhibitions all over the world. And one very large and influential exhibition you curated a couple of years ago to Milan Triennale called Broken Nature. Can you tell us uh, in a nutshell of the kind of concept and idea behind the Broken Nature exhibition and, and why you wanted to curate that, ex that exhibition? Yes, that was, um, I'm very proud of that exhibition. It was uh, a great team. You know, the other, the other part of the team were Ala Tanir, Laura Mairan, and Erika Petrillo. And it was the 22nd Milan Triennale. So it was part of a long tradition of exhibitions and, and affairs that have to do with the future of the world and what design and architecture can do for it. And it was called Broken Nature because it was about trying to replenish and uh, rethread the ties that connect human beings to the rest of nature. Because one of the important tenets is that we are part of nature. We're not separate and distant from it. So everything we do to nature, we do to ourselves. And it was about choosing objects that would uh, create a, a, 
a feeling of possibility and also of necessity in citizens. It was an exhibition for citizens. We wanted to propose an idea of restorative design. So the difference between restorative design and what is normally called sustainable design is a sort of desirability. It's pleasure, it's aesthetics, it's uh, elegance, it's everything that we seek from, the de from design, but that was traditionally denied responsible design. You know, it was mm -hmm. responsible design without self-flagellation. It was examples of objects that were good and great and, and, and beautiful. So um, these objects were at all scales. It ranged from visualizations of changes in the planet uh, with satellite images from NASA. It was biodegradable uh, pregnancy tests that are good for the planet and good for your privacy. It was visualizations of possible outcomes depending on our actions on Earth of today. So it was really very wide ranging, um, super well installed by uh, Studio Folder there in Milano. And altogether, it made, it made us really proud. As I mentioned, it was for citizens because we knew that we were playing in, uh, in a place where citizens are interested in design. And it was meant to give a sense of long term, of responsibility, of pleasure, and also of uh, action and activism. We wanted everybody who came to the show to leave with a sense of what they could do in their everyday life. And if I can add only one thing that really made me proud, it was 2019 and kids all over the world were doing Fridays for the Future to follow Greta Thunberg's diktat. And the kids in Milan were meeting in the exhibition to start marching. So what better, I mean, that was a sign of pride and of success of the exhibition. It was definitely a great exhibition. And like you said, it was Thank uh, 2019 you. when the exhibition was. Uh, now, if you look back uh, when making that exhibition and planning that exhibition and you look into today, do you see that we have gone forward or are we do, still doing the same mistakes over and over again? Or, or there, is there more hope? I think we're definitely going forward. I think that ever since that time, there's been so much that happened, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, um, Afghanistan, I mean, you name it, fl fires, floods, uh, the world has gone forward also in tragedy, not only in progress. Sure. But you know, these tragedies cement the need to act. But I think that in the banality of everyday life, I can see progress. You know, I, uh, New York was always a bit behind in recycling, for instance. And right now, instead, companies and institutions all over the city are establishing sustainability goals. They are recycling actively. I know that this might seem trivial, but it's very important to me because I remember moving to this country 28 years ago and being appalled because they were not recycling aluminum cans, right? Which is the no brainer. It was the beginning of all recycling, the ground zero of all recycling. So, so I think a lot of progress is being made also because of the new generation. And I don't mean to be cute, but I love Generation Z and I don't know what comes next. Also the kids, because they are just very matter of fact about this being normalcy, not something that you have to do because it's, it's your duty just because it's normal. Mm -hmm. And that's what I aspire to, all of this sense of responsibility becoming normal. I think that's very good and very important point. And I, I see that in the younger generation as well, with my kids, uh, uh, you know, from a personal experience. But um, we also promised to talk a little bit about the Nordic and Nordic design um, mm -hmm. this uh, series. And, you know, in Nordic design, and especially maybe in Finland, there has been very, very strong links to nature as well. And you know Nordic design and Finnish design very well and functionalism um, and those principles still going strong in Finnish design. Do you see kind of um, strength in those Nordic design principles that are take, can take us, us forward as well? Or how do you see Nordic contemporary design? Absolutely. First of all, at all scales, Nordic design has some basic values that are fundamental for us to move forward. I'm thinking, for instance, of the idea of care. You know, 
uh, right now there is a big movement in the United States and I think all over the world to recognize the role of caretakers, to recognize the role also of family members that take care of people that are mm, invalid or that have to stay at home or caretakers, nurses, you know, their value has been absolutely re-examined after the pandemic, but also from a legal and policy standpoint. Well, Finland was always about care. And uh, Nordic design was always about care. And you can see that in the uh, sanatoria that have become almost iconic for the idea of, of, uh, of Finnish design, but also in the way more contemporary design has taken care of people with different abilities, differently abled people. So it's always been a kind of design that, that values altruism, that, that values a society in which people take care of each other. I find that the most contemporary and important um, aspect of design, because of course it starts with other human beings, maybe members of our family, members of our community, our city, our nation, but then it naturally expands to other species. And that's what we need right now, a sense of, uh, a sense of altruism that is also selfish if you want, if you want, it's self-centered because our survival depends on the survival of others. Mm -hmm. True, true. And, you know, with this vaccination polemics right now, it's, it's stunning to see the opposite being instead true mm -hmm. in so many parts of the world. That's true. That's true. But um, you have also talked about or used the term investigative design. Um, is that a continuation of critical design and the work of like Dunn and Raby or is that something else? Can you elaborate a little bit of what's... Yes, it is. But in a way, um, I would say that I uh, borrowed that word from the world of architecture. I have to say that possibly uh, one of the first examples of most well-known example are forensic architecture. Mm -hmm. You probably know the group that is at Goldsmiths University. Yeah. Um, and um, they became the more famous ones. There are others. You know, there's also Teddy Cruz and Fona Forman in San Diego. But there are these, um, I, would, I would start with forensic architecture. They are um, architects professional architects that have created interdisciplinary teams that use the tools of architecture to help investigations in the real world, to help uh, magistrates bring to justice people, whether it's like local crimes or NGO boats that help um, migrants in the Mediterranean. So they put the tools of architecture and the know-how of architecture in the service of humanity and of, uh, and of legal and of magistrates. And the same happens with designers, for instance, like Forma Fantasma. And you could see, you could say that it's, um, it's an emanation of the critical design of the early aughts or the 1990s, because it has that the criticality that is very important. Um, Forma Fantasma, I'm sure that you are most of you are familiar with them, but in Broken Nature, they presented a project, a research project that they had initiated for Melbourne, for the National Gallery Victoria in Melbourne uh, two years before, which is an exploration of the um, underbelly of electronic waste recycling or disposal. Um, by showing beautiful objects made with electronic waste, they also took the opportunity to attract everybody's attention to the criminality, labor exploitation, toxicity, and altogether um, danger that electronic mm -hmm. waste, unregulated electronic waste presents to the world. So investigative design and investigative architecture is one of the most direct forms of activism that can be embraced from the fields of architecture and design. That's very good. And actually, those who are in Finland or visiting Finland, you can actually see forensic architecture at the Finnish uh, Museum of Architecture this fall. So if you are in Helsinki, please do go see that exhibition because I think it's very, very good. And like, like Paula said, forensic architecture is really a forerunner in that area of uh, investigative design. And we actually hope to see the former Fantas at some point in Helsinki as well, I hope. I hope oh, that would be great. It's so perfect for Helsinki. <laughs> Because, mm. well, not only, not, not our streams, but they also did an, a newer exhibition called Cambio that is about mm -hmm. the timber industry. Yeah. So it's super, uh, it would be perfect. It is, and it relates with the Finnish uh, kind of industries very strongly as well. So. But one other term that you have also used, or one area of design that I know that you're interested in is, is uh, politics and design. 
can you say a little bit about how you see politics and design going together? I mean, I know that there are kind of these service design projects about uh, governmental design, about improving the processes and putting people first. But I think you, you, I, you think you mean maybe a little bit different uh, thing. With well, that. in a way, everything that I've talked about was about politics and design. You know, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, I come from Italy and. In Italy, people talk about football and talk about politics, right? So politics is, is life. And mm -hmm. um, uh, everything that happens outside the family circle, maybe even inside the family circle, is politics. So politics is living together, right? And um, that's why everything that I mentioned so far is about politics. And I believe that it's incredibly important for designers to be educated in the social sciences, like you know, the, going to school for design and only having a background in art is really misleading. I think that the social sciences and some material sciences, of course, too, but anthropology, sociology, material culture are fundamental because design is politics. What about when it comes to politicians? and design is there any how can we design get designers to take kind of top politician and get the understanding of politicians well it depends on the politicians like i, I was thinking for instance um our beloved um, prime minister of new zealand she really believes in design and she's always been mm -hmm. using design so that's without even mentioning but many other and in the, and in Nordic countries, uh, politicians know the value of design, um, but even in countries like Italy, they don't. They keep on saying in Italy, they keep on talking about the made in Italy as if design were only about the commercial assets and this mm -hmm. kind of like image of Italy that is projected into the world. Um, a few years ago, I wish I remembered his name, there was a wonderful Dutch designer who unfortunately passed away very, very young that had a whole website and uh, association that was about design and government. I wish I remembered his name because he deserves that. Do you? You don't remember either? Mm -mm. No. That, anyway, so um, we need to educate our government to understand the value of design, to understand that it's not only embellishment, but it, that it's really an attitude towards the future that is constructive and that you know, I like to say that designers are the enzyme of progress. They are the ones mm -hmm. that make revolutions and new policies into reality by creating objects of all kinds that people can use to behave according to these policies. So um, it's something that as designers, we should all work on. Definitely, definitely. And I think it's interesting when you talk about, you know, what design is and how designers should work. And I'm curious to hear your view. You work all over the world and do you see in different parts of parts of the world, design being understood very differently. And where do you see the kind of issues about the word design being problematic today? It's really a, a good point. I think that I'm wondering if there's one place in the world where I see design being considered the way I wish it were considered, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe it is in Nordic countries, maybe. You know, I'm just trying to think if there's, because, um, you know, in Italy, I told you, it's this problem. They keep on hammering this idea of design as furniture or as fashion and the made in Italy and so on and so forth. Um, in, in Nordic country, the social value of design is understood better. Um, but I feel that, uh, let me put it another way. Every different place has different strengths. Like I remember, for instance, when I came to New York, I didn't know anything about contemporary art and instead children breathed contemporary art, right? So mm -hmm. a friend of mine, the, my best friend in New York, she had a three-year-old kid that was getting these mailings from the, the children's gallery. Right. And um, and I remember he wanted me he took my hand one day. We were living in Soho and he wanted to cross the street and show me some Julian Schnabel totems. They were very not very childlike. Um, you go to some parts of Latin America and the default knowledge, the default language is a pretty great uh, form of modernism. So modernist architecture. So you get a, a home made by anyone and it turns out to be a really beautiful modernism. In Italy, it's design, you know, so different people have different strengths that are part of the material culture. True. 
And it's up to us to really give design the name that we want it to have. That's true. That's a very good point. And hopefully the next generation will kind of take it forward as well. And of course, you know, design as a discipline or even a strand of disciplines, it's the evolution rate of design has been so rapid. So, oh my God, there are such great friends online. Ciao, Lucia. Oh my God. Sorry, some people that I haven't seen in a long time. It's great. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> and I'm thank you all for the good thoughts. Everybody's sending good thoughts about New York today. So I, I want to thank mm -hmm. you all. Mm -mm. I think that's very important. And now you have mm -mm. spent about 45 minutes in your closet. And, uh... yeah, I know. I want to I want to apologize also to Lena and to no. Minnie. You know what? You know how dumb I am? I am such a creature, like a worldly person. I didn't understand that EET is Eastern European time. Duh, as we say here, not CET. Stupid. No. Anyway, so... You I don't have the lighting that I was expecting to have. <laughs> no, but the lighting has worked be beautifully and the acoustics and the sound in, in your closet is, is fantastic. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, uh, do you have other thoughts or issues that you would like oh to Oh my God, up how many? I can, I can bring up as many issues as you want, but it, it's like, it can go on forever. I just um, really hope two things. I hope that this pandemic will be over. Um, mm -hmm as soon as possible and we all have to work at it so I, I don't have to tell you we we all have to do what we can but the second thing is that i really hope that we will also work hard on the metaverse um because what one of the effects of this pandemic is to create more familiarity online more ease and also more awkwardness i mean there are all these like funny episodes of people exposing themselves on zoom that <laughs> will just go on forever but um, there's also this emergence of, um, I mean, there's, a, there's been a lot of development on the metaverse and you know what the metaverse is, so I don't have to tell you. But we have to make sure as designers that the ethics and the aesthetics um, and the functionality of the metaverse is studied well since the beginning. You know, it's really quite important uh, because very often when there's a new technology or a new dimension, there's a moment of drunkenness and then sobriety mm -hmm. hits in and we can all use it with relative ease and safety. Maybe we can speed up the drunkenness moment so that we can get to use the metaverse in, a, in a, an effective way to complement our physical travel and maybe to reduce emissions. Hmm. I think what about you? Point. Something you want to um, say? I don't know. I think this, I just, I, I echo what you said. And I think that's kind of, the pandemic, the pandemic has kind of stopped us, or slowed us down, and now we think that once the pandemic is over, everything is good. But I see the kind of other wicked problems that have been kind of shadowed by uh, by COVID nineteen. You know, the automation or robotization, the kind of fifth and fourth and fifth industrial revolution. How big those effects will be in all, with all of us, and how we kind of make those changes understandable. And especially, I'm thinking out from institutional view is that how we can actually bring hope and open kind of a positive worldview for our visitors and viewers online as well, and really kind of create clarity. clarity. And I, I mm -hmm. like to think back to 1851 when the V&A Museum was opened in, in London after the Great Exhibition and really during the first industrial revolution really make you understand of, about the changes that are happening and what kind of future is waiting us. And now I think, you know, the changes are so much, so much faster and we need that same kind of understanding of the future that is waiting for us and we need to make that future together and I think design is such a powerful tool in making that future and making that future not only um, ecologically sustainable but also socially sustainable as well and we really the whole world need to come together to work on that and I see glimpses of hope of that every once in a while but then there's these gloomier moments um, as well but um, I, I hope we're getting there and, and we understand how we can use design in that. And, and like I said in the beginning, you are really such an activist on talking about Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, thank you. and congratulations on your first Instagram live. Now you're going to, you're going to just like go on forever. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been really good. And of course, talking to you, it's so easy. And uh, mm -hmm. just listening to you about your view about design and the potential of design is just amazing. Thank you. You come. But, um, 
but I think it's time that we can let you out of the closet and go and enjoy uh, the beautiful day in New York. And we really want to thank you for, for taking part in our Kaleidoscope uh, online festival and talking to us about design. Your views are really, really important and really give us fuel uh, for understanding what we can use. Thank you. For, uh, not only in Finland and Nordic countries, but all over the world. Thank so, you. And thanks to thank Mini so and Dina. Much. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, Paula. Thank you so much and hope to see you live soon as well. And thank you all viewers as well. This was our second uh, edition of the Kaleidoscope Online Festival. And uh, we hope you to see you also tomorrow for the third and the final session of the Kaleidoscope Festival at 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern European time. And uh, there will be this 20 minute guided tour of natural surroundings nearby the city of Helsinki. So it will give you a kind of a moment to relax and unwind as well. But on my behalf, um, thanks, thanks for watching and um, I hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye.